It's 96.3 FM, WQXR, and at 825, it's a calm and lovely, clear Tuesday morning. And you're in for a beautiful day. September 11th was a morning that began just like any other. 25 miles from New York in Summit, New Jersey, more than 1,000 residents took the 35-minute train ride to the World Trade Center. 33 residents in the Summit area were killed that day, but Todd Ranke was not on the list of the dead or the injured anywhere. He's my whole life. I don't know if you know anybody like that, but he's my whole life. An estimated 3,000 children lost a parent on September 11th, 19 of them in Summit. Children like Rachel and Ella Thompson, when it came to Lent this year, and we said to Rachel, what are you giving up for Lent? She looked us in the eye and she said, I gave up my father in September, that's enough, don't you think? Did 343 firefighters have to die? That question continues to haunt Thomas von Essen, who on September 11th was New York City's fire commissioner. Some people losing a husband and a son, other people losing two sons. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. So I would question, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I hope there's a God I've always wanted to believe there was. I can't believe he's making conscious decisions that this stuff happens. The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center were more than just symbols of American finance. The people who worked there were at the very heart of it like the small investment banking firm of Sandler O'Neill. Of Sandler O'Neill's 171 employees, 83 reported for work at the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th. Only 17 made it out alive. When we talked in September, you were saying, we're going to carry on, we're going to make this work. That's right. Uh, we're going to stay in business. Did you believe that? Not really. Are you surprised it's worked out the way it has? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that you're now being scapegoated? We are conveniently targeted. We are Arabs, we are uh, Muslims, we are uh, sh male chauvinistic pigs, you name it. Portraying the Saudis like uh, devils. <laughs> are they devils? Not if you talk to Saudi Arabia's foreign minister. The moment that we found to our remorse that so many of those involved in the attack were Saudis. The first thing that occurred to my mind is, how can this happen? Senator, you've said, I think it's about certain that we're going to see a biological attack in the U.S. with the intent to kill. You believe that? I do believe that. We know. We know, our intelligence community knows, that uh, 12, over 12 countries have developed offensive biological weapon programs. It only makes sense that those weapons are likely to be used. I think uh, because of the kind of times that we live in, Mike, that we have to anticipate that. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Steve Croft. I'm Leslie Stahl. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on this special edition of 60 Minutes. Nearly a year after terrorists destroyed the World Trade Center, hundreds of communities in the suburbs of New York City are still struggling with grief, anger, and uncertainty over the loss of loved ones who were killed and those who were never found. In Summit, New Jersey, a town of 20,000 people, well, about 3,000, or one in five adults, worked as bond traders, investment bankers, stockbrokers, and clerks in the Twin Towers and surrounding buildings. 33 residents in the summit area were killed that day, nearly as many as the town lost in the Vietnam War. We first reported the summit story just days after the attack, and since then, we have been following widows, children, friends, and neighbors as they try to rebuild their lives. It's been the longest year in the life of this American town. 96.3 FM, WQXR, at 825. It's a calm and lovely, clear Tuesday morning. And you're in for a beautiful day. September 11th was a morning that began just like any other. 
25 miles from New York in Summit, New Jersey, a comfortable, seemingly sheltered town where everyone knows his or her neighbors, more than a thousand residents took the 35-minute train ride to the World Trade Center. One of them was Todd Ranke, a father of three young children and a bond salesman whose office was on the 104th floor of the South Tower. Just three days after the attack, we spoke with Todd's wife, Debbie, before she knew what had happened to him. He calls every morning when he's at work. So on Tuesday, he called you? Like he always does. It was a little before 9. And uh, he called and said, good morning. How are the kids? How are you? And he said, oh, my God, we've been hit. Something is the matter. Something happened. Boy, that was loud. And I said, just listen to me. You've got to get out of there. And then I can't remember what happened next. Debbie Reinke watched it all happen on TV, yet she believed that Todd was still alive and would come home. That evening in Summit, 3,000 residents filled the village green at a candlelight prayer service for those who were missing, and the magnitude of the disaster on this small town began to hit home. Let us pray. For David Brady, Edward Calderon, for Jim Connors, for Todd Ranke, we pray, O oh God. On September 12th, Debbie Ranke and a dozen family members hit the streets of New York City looking for any sign of Todd. They didn't know then just how few had survived the collapse of the Twin Towers. Where's that ambulance going? There were 130 hospitals where Todd Ranke could have been taken. Did you get anybody during the night? No one this morning. The Rankies were determined to check every one of them. You know, he could be in there. I know. He could be in there. Have so, you gotten any um, names in the last four hours? Um, they have. But as I said, we don't happen to have that particular How name. About they searched for three days, but Todd Ranky was not on the list of the dead or the injured anywhere. That was almost too much for Debbie to bear. But she wouldn't stop looking for it. At this point, you still have hope. You haven't given up. Oh, no. I, I know he's out there somewhere, and we just have to find him. You're very strong, very courageous. We're a strong group, and we're going to get through this. I can see that. Oh, God. Okay. 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 Anybody like that, but he's my whole life. Back in Summit, family members and neighbors gathered on the Rankies' front lawn, praying for Todd's return. You pull it, Todd. Pull it, Todd. Todd Jr. raised the American flag in honor of his father, and then lowered it to half staff. In the days after the attack, there were visible signs of just how hard Summit had been hit. In the commuter parking lots near the train station, police kept track of the missing by counting the many cars that were never picked up. And in the schools, teachers took on a new role, dealing with the sudden sense of fear and uncertainty in their classrooms. Ted Stanick is the principal of the Summit Middle School. Education's about teaching science, social studies, math. On 9-11, none of those things were important. It was more about how could I protect how can I protect kids from these kinds of, this kind of pain? One of the children is in my classroom, and, you know, we just all hoped for her that her father would be okay. And then as each day passed by, you know, your, your tongue gets tied, and your heart just goes out, and you wonder, you know, where do we go from here? Richard Conwisher, a Presbyterian minister in Summit, went door to door all across town checking up on the members of his congregation who worked at the World Trade Center to see if they had come home. The last house that I went to was that of Debbie and Todd Ranke. She came running to me and said, oh God, Todd, you're home. And, uh, and ran up and embraced me. And it was only as the, the seconds drew on that she realized 
that it was her pastor and not her husband, because she had been hoping for so long that finally he had come home. In April, seven months after the attacks, Todd Ranke's remains were finally identified. We spoke to Debbie again soon after she got the news. It was less than a year ago that we met. But in so many ways, it seems like a lifetime. For me, I, can, I can't imagine what it must be like for you today. It's difficult today because when I saw you, I was thinking how nice it would be to tell a story that had a happy ending. I wish we had found him. Was there a moment when it became clear to you that you wouldn't find him? When they came to my door and told me that they had found his remains. Seven months later. Yeah, my daughter thought that he, they found him alive. And, um, and... So for all of those months, six, seven months, she still had, she still had hope. I think we all did. Remarkably, Todd's wallet was recovered intact from the rubble of the World Trade Center. Inside were pictures of his three children, all still covered in dust. It was amazing to me that they found it. Is it almost ready, Mom? It's almost ready. Are you hungry? The traumatic effects of September 11th are still lingering, especially on the children. The New York City Board of Education found that more than 75,000 school children in the New York area still suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, fear of public places, and nightmares six months after the attacks. Todd Ranke Jr. had constant nightmares. He's sad a lot. And then I started crying when we were talking about the nightmares about the uh, Twin Towers. And he puts his arm on my shoulder, seven-year-old, and he said, Mommy, it'll be all right. We'll have good times again. I'm supposed to be saying that. <laughs> Debbie says her son stopped having as many nightmares after he was given a teddy bear made from one of his dad's shirts. And surprisingly, after he visited Ground Zero. You really wanted to go there? Yeah. Why? Because it reminds me of my dad. My mom would always cry when she went there, and I would always, like, help her. What do you say to your mom when, when you see her cry? I just hug her, and then I kind of feel sad. It's hard for her sometimes. Mm -hmm. Hard for you sometimes. Because mm -hmm. I don't have a dad. And Todd Jr. is not alone. An estimated 3,000 children lost a parent on September 11th, 19 of them in Summit children like Rachel and Ella Thompson, who lived just down the street from the Rankies. They moved to Summit from England 10 years ago with their mother, Lucy, and their father, Ian, who had always wanted to work in the World Trade Center. What was your husband like? Larger than life. The life and soul of every party. Very, very sensitive, jolly man, big. A little kid in an extra, 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 extra large costume. And he lived every day of life. Like he was his last. Yeah. He spent his last day working on the 84th floor of the South Tower. And nearly nine months later, Ian Thompson was among the 1,900 victims of the attack whose remains had still not been identified. I think finding out that there's something that hit the World Trade Center was hard, really, really hard. But waiting was even worse. It, you, you, you just wait and wait and you sit down you just wait even months afterwards even into january and february i was still looking for my dad in cars and expecting to hear him on the phone or, or listening to him walk up the stairs in the basement and i will never ever ever give up my hopes that I can find out what happened to my husband. I will never stop. Can you live with the possibility that you may never know for sure? No, I won't ever really accept that. What Lucy and her daughters have to accept now are the constant, almost daily reminders 
of how much they have lost. They look at families and they notice. I look at couples and I notice, but they particularly notice the lack of their father. I find myself driving away from the soccer fields and things so that they don't necessarily see the dads who are coaching. If they think about it enough as it is, but they are strong. They've proved they're very strong. Everybody says, oh, I don't know how you survive, but if it happened to them, they'd survive, hopefully. How do you survive? We you just live each we day. Live every day. Every single day. She feels her pain very deeply. When it came to Lent this year, and we said to Rachel, what are you giving up for Lent? She looked, she looked us in the eye and she said, I gave up my father in September. That's enough, don't you think? As difficult as it is for Rachel, Ella, and the other children who lost a parent in the attacks, it's also difficult for their friends and classmates who sometimes just don't know what to say. It's kind of hard to be around them because they're, they sometimes, they don't show their emotions because it's really hard for them. They act happy, but you know inside that they're sad. You don't want to make them cry, make them feel really bad. So, kind of, I try, try to stay away from the topic. You had a total of seven buildings that were here. You had Tower One, which was the north. Over the past year, many of the children in this community have dealt with the tragedy head on by going on school field trips to Ground Zero and seeing where their friends and neighbors die. The death toll is 2,823. What makes you angriest about this? To think that someone would actually do this to a na our nation because they should know that we're strong. They should know that this isn't going to get to us or that we're going to fight back. They should know that they're going to pay for what they did. Do you think that you've learned anything since 9-11? I think that when we said the Pledge of Allegiance before September 11th, it seemed more of a chore. But now everyone means what they say. Who were you closest to who was really affected by this? Ian Thompson. It must be difficult for you as well. Yeah. It's bad that someone as nice as him would die that way. Since Ian Thompson's death, life for his family has not only been an emotional struggle, but a financial one. Very wet, darling. I'm sorry I'm so late. Of the more than $2 billion raised by private charities, Lucy has received just enough to cover basic living expenses for the next year. And like most victims' families, she has not yet applied for relief from the federal government's Victims' Compensation Fund because of concerns about legal constraints. To make ends meet, Lucy works as a real estate agent. Right. Now, at the time of, of his death... And for months, until Lucy recently became a U.S. citizen, the IRS was threatening to tax her entire inheritance at a rate about 10 times higher than that of American widows of 9-11. She faced the possibility of losing her home and most of her savings. Do you ever feel that this is more than you can handle? You have moments like that? I know there's that, that ridiculous saying, which is, I, and I think I'm right in quoting, you know, God doesn't give you more than you can ever handle. Well, he does. He does, and he did. But you just have to handle it because you have to survive. And my reason for surviving is that I have two beautiful children within. And I just want to make their lives as okay as I can. The federal government is investigating why only about half of the money raised by charities has been distributed to the victims' families. When we come back, we'll take you to where Lucy Thompson, Debbie Reinke, and more than 70 other widows from the summit areas seek refuge the only place where everyone understands the depth of their pain, a place they say they can't live without. Billion dollars to compensate those who lost loved ones in the attacks. So far, only a handful of families out of nearly 3,000 have gotten any money from that fund. Most have not even applied because they'd have to give up their right to sue and they are critical of the formula under which the money would be distributed. And while the money from some private charities is also slow in coming, many families have gotten financial and emotional support from their neighbors. 
Nowhere is that more evident than in Summit, New Jersey, where the community has shown extraordinary acts of kindness. But on the days where that's not enough, the only people the widows can turn to are each other. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember them. Every week for the past year, more than 70 women from Summit and neighboring towns, wives who lost husbands, mothers who lost sons, meet once a week for up to five hours at a time to work through their grief. Todd Ranke. Debbie Ranke has been coming to this bereavement group for the past 10 months. We really honor our husbands there through candle lighting or writing notes to them or talking about them. And it's, it's also a group where you help yourself go on each day. And they really try to help you become stronger. Let's see that picture. The women try to regain their strength by bringing in pictures of their loved ones and talking openly about what they've lost. You I have my wedding picture here. Carol Linehan lost her husband, Thomas. We met on a blind date. And you know, he always made me feel like I could do anything. And I know now he's looking at me and I hear him saying, I know you could do it. I'm going to say it to you, too. I know you can do this. I promise you, you will. I was actually having a good day until I got here. <laughs> but this is good. Do I have a volunteer? Oh, For them, healing also comes from some of the smallest things, like makeup tips from cosmetics mogul Bobby Brown. This is really the first time that I've dealt with with sadness and what it does to your face. But I really believe if you pretend you look good, you do look good and you feel better. Oh, that's pretty. Isn't that pretty? Yeah. Yeah, look how pretty you look. The most difficult day of the year was Father's Day, especially for the many widows whose babies were born after their fathers were killed. To mark the day, the women brought in their husband's favorite meal and had a luncheon. Where's Daddy's shrimp cocktail for you? Grief counselors say that food triggers unexpectedly strong memories and emotions, which the women confront directly in this group. You might, in, in 10 years from now, open that refrigerator and the, and the tears could spring down. Michael last David. month, the bereavement group held its last meeting. Bless this tower. The women dedicated a monument to their husbands, a bell tower made from two steel beams recovered from the World Trade Center. May it be a lasting symbol of remembrance. And the love we have for them. I was sad for an extremely long time. And it just, at one point, I just got tired of being sad. It, it just, your heart hurts so much and your whole body aches for such a long time, what well, seems like an eternity. Did you ever reach a point where you felt that I, I either have to sink or swim here? <laughs> yes. I made that decision to swim. And helping Debbie Ranke and the many other widows stay afloat has been a full-time mission for the town of Summit. Every week since September 11th, a group of women has prepared meals for the families and delivered them to their homes. We can't fill in the gap of a missing father or a missing spouse, but we can take off some of the pressure of when those gaps really can swallow one up. Local handymen have volunteered to do jobs around the house that their husbands used to do. Everybody wanted to do something. I'm a lucky guy because I get to help. Yeah. The children of Summit have been holding benefit concerts and walkathons to raise money for the families who lost a loved one. Mothers have planted a peace garden at the elementary school. The local soccer team has been having bake sales. And from halfway across the country, students in Michigan, strangers who had heard about what happened to Summit, raised money and came to the middle school with a gift of oak trees to commemorate those who died. 
There are students and spouses who have very directly felt this loss. We hope that through the act of planting these trees, that each of these folks that have joined us today will find some comfort that will help us move forward with our lives. Lucy Thompson says her daughters were afraid that after a while, people would forget. I remember my eldest daughter saying to me, Mom, I'm really frightened when people start going away and not coming back again. And um, several of my friends must have heard this and have made a concerted effort not to let that happen. In fact, 40 of Lucy Thompson's friends and neighbors got together when she and her daughters were away. They took an unfinished basement and working 24 hours a day for six days straight, built a completely new finished family room. I think all of our uh, hope was that Lucy would find and the girls would find an oasis here, away from this awful madness that had happened. So none of this was finished? Nothing. No walls? No walls. No finished walls? No finished walls. No, no ceiling? No television? Nothing. Wow. That's an amazing job. And they fixed everything up and completely changed the whole of the basement. It's beautiful. Really, really nice. They say they did it not only to help the Thompsons, but to help themselves cope with the enormity of what had happened. I saw the towers on fire that morning. And when I got home, I didn't know what to do. And you, you knew you wanted to help but you didn't know where to go. You had to do something. And this was something that was tangible. It was construction in the face of destruction. My goal had been to give them hope again. And I certainly heard that in their voices. What does it say about this community of Summit that nearly a year after the attacks, the community is still focusing on efforts to help you? Yes, it means that they haven't given up for us. They haven't given up on us. They are incredibly generous people who are, are really desperate to try and do something that helps. As the year went along, the familiar rituals continued. At the 4th of July parade, there was more red, white, and blue than ever. But there is still an uneasy feeling that life is not yet back to normal. If you look just below the surface, there's a tremendous amount of emotion, of mourning, and, and even anger. I find myself in tears a lot, and I think that's what a lot of people go through. You just start talking, and all of a sudden, the emotions, they've, they've never left you, and they're right here, and they just come breaking through. Well, my It's especially difficult for the thousands of Summit residents who were working in and around the World Trade Center that day and got out alive. Every day, these men take the ferry across the Hudson River to go back to their jobs within steps of ground zero. How is it different today for you coming here? Sometimes you're sort of in your morning commute with the coffee and the newspaper, and you're sort of thinking about your day. But you, know, you get off that ferry, and you glance at that emptiness, and it hits you. Every morning, you get a, a little glimpse that brings you back. Like so many others, they witnessed the terror that morning and say they are still haunted by it. I was about right here uh, when all the horror was going on above us and ferocious debris just flying over the atrium. And every time, you know, you sort of walk to work, you kind of look at that atrium and, and you remember that. It was, it's interesting. Everyone looked up when that airplane went overhead. Absolutely. I mean, is that the kind of thing that you talk about when you, you, you never get away from it? Even at home, when, I, when I aircraft goes over the yard, you know, I still think about it. How do you think that you guys have changed since 9-11? Having a feeling of uh, vulnerability, one I'd never had before, you always think it won't happen to yourself. And then a day like that lets you see that it could happen to anyone at any time. You still feel threatened? I still have a feeling about me that I did not have prior to that day. It took eight months to clear the wreckage of the World Trade Center. Trees it! Homes! Just days after Ground Zero was officially closed in May, Lucy Thompson and her daughters were notified that Ian's remains had finally been identified from his DNA. I wanted to keep on wishing that he would still come back. I didn't actually think it, I just wished it. 
I really wasn't expecting it. But I think it'll give us some sense of, um, maybe some sense of acceptance. Because it's been very much like living in limbo Hello. for nine months. The Thompsons had already held a memorial service for Ian last September. Now Lucy must decide what to do with his remains. She asked us to go with her to meet with a funeral director who has already buried four men from Summit who died in the attack. She faces a wrenching question. Does she bury her husband's remains or have them cremated? And I'm sort of nervous about cremation okay. because I'm sure so much of it went on during that particular day and Absolutely. then the ensuing yeah. weeks. Um, if you feel more satisfied, you know, with taking his remains and we can put them in a, in a small receptacle of some sort or depending on how much is remaining, yes. we can bury them at Fairmount and you can have a little ceremony for the children. And it's a place for the children to go. Exactly. Now, yes. there's a new section they opened up here, which, yes. and that's where Todd Ranke is. And she chose to bury Ian in a plot that is just 20 yards away from the grave of her neighbor, Todd Ranke. One of the things that, of course, the terrorists don't realize they can't ever take away is wonderful memories and happy times and family times. You, you can't take that away from anybody. And we remember such, lo such a lot of things, don't we, Rachel? Thank goodness. If you've got a dad, spend a lot of time with him. The Reiki children do just that by visiting the cemetery once a week with Debbie. We would get red, white, and blue flowers and put them on a grave. I bet our dad would be proud of us. What would you say to the people who did this? I'd say that wasn't very nice to kill all these people. Now you made a lot of people very, very sad. Rachel Thompson says she tries not to dwell on the sadness. She made a poster of the planes crashing into the World Trade Center and inscribed it with words she says she tries to live by. And what you wrote at the bottom? Do not let the terrorists overpower us. Where did that come from? Me. You can't let the terrorists overpower you. You can't spend your whole life win. weeping and crying and sulking. You have to go out there and do what other people would have wanted you to do. In the beginning, I was nervous about other people. It's impossible to look back at September 11th without remembering New York City's firefighters. The images of those men running up the stairs while thousands of office workers were running down are etched in memory. But since the attacks, questions have been raised about how the department responded that day a response that took the lives of 343 firefighters. Thomas von Essen, the city's fire commissioner, a plain-spoken firefighter who worked his way up to the top job, was the man in charge on the department's worst day. Today, Ground Zero is a vast, uncertain emptiness. Von Essen's term as commissioner ended last January, and he left along with Mayor Giuliani. But he admits he will always be imprisoned by the memories of that day. The first plane struck the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. Von Essen was in the lobby by 9 with Chief Peter Hayden, who was already directing the rescue effort. He had made a decision already that they weren't going to be able to put the fire out, that their mission would be to get as many firefighters up, to get as many civilians out as quickly as possible. And I think everything was fine until that second plane hit. That's when people started to think that this was going to spin out of control. And it did. The chiefs were now trying to evacuate two buildings, but they were having difficulty figuring out where their units were. Some had not checked in with commander, but had gone straight up. Did you suspect the buildings might collapse? Well, Chief Downey said that to me in the north lobby, I think right after the second tower was hit. He said, boss, these buildings can collapse. But no fear in his voice, no panic, no rush. It wasn't, we got to get everybody out of here. He was not, you know, uh, nervous or anything. And I think what they all assumed was, yes, these buildings can collapse, but nobody dreamed in an hour and 42 minutes. Nobody. 
The South Tower stood for 57 minutes before collapsing at 9.59 a.m. At 10.28 a.m., the North Tower came down. When the North Tower came down, at that point, were you beginning to calculate what your losses were? I knew that the losses would be um, monumental, but we didn't get a handle on the numbers for a long time because we had so many heroic guys that were actually working on a day off. Late on the night of September 11th, Von Essen gave an update. We've got um, over 300 people that are missing that uh, we can't account for. We believe that many of, uh, many of them are, uh, are, uh, are gone. As you were trying to tally your losses, you looked absolutely shattered. Well, I was, you know. And uh, when I think about it, I still am. But, you know, you just keep going. And that night, we, we were starting to get names. You know, all afternoon, the names were coming in. Names like Bill Feehan the department's legendary deputy commissioner. Your friend Bill Fian was there. How come? Here's a guy in his 70s. What's he doing in there fighting a fire? He certainly didn't have to be there, but he just was one of those people. You know, he, he was always a chief first. Did you try to get him to leave? Yeah, I had actually tried to get him to go, but uh, he didn't listen to me. A lot of times he didn't listen to me. A lot of guys who died that day weren't grizzled veterans. Uh, there were new guys, new recruits. Did any of those young guys stick out in your mind? We were just talking uh, the other day about a kid, Michael Camerata. We went to his funeral, and there were all his friends on Staten Island were getting up. Mikey the face, they kept calling him. He was a really good-looking kid. He was, uh, you know, he's only on a job uh, a very short time, and that's, that's what it was. It went from people with seven weeks on a job to people like Bill Feehan and Donald Burns at Ray Downey with over 40 years. You described the guys who died as being warriors as much as firefighters. What do you mean? Somebody says to you, we got to get out of here. The boss downstairs has told us to evacuate the building. And you say, okay, okay, but I've got to go up because I just got a May Day from Rescue One. I mean, you know, what, what, what kind of guy are you to do that? That's not just uh, doing your job. That's not just being a hero. That takes you to the next level. There were men who ignored the order to evacuate. But it's also become clear that many firefighters in the North Tower, the second to fall, never got the evacuation order issued a half hour before the collapse. 121 men did not make it out of the tower. That's the one that, that hurts, because we had time. The, the South Tower had fallen, so you really wish you could have gotten everybody out of that building. Last March, the city asked the consulting firm McKinsey & Company to do a post-mortem on the fire department's response to the attacks. Its report was released three weeks ago. It concluded, among other things, that communications, faulty radios, were a major problem. I've heard people say, People died because the radios weren't working. I think that's a horrible thing to say. The radios were working. Were they working perfectly? No. If there's a fire tonight in Chicago and Boston and Detroit, I've talked to chiefs around the country, they're going to have that problem in those buildings. In high rises, for handheld radios to work properly, booster devices called repeaters are needed so signals can penetrate the steel and concrete. The World Trade Center had them, but it's still unclear how well they were working. If the repeaters aren't working, if the guys aren't on a repeater channel, if there's 300, 400 firefighters talking at the same time on a radio with, you know, everybody yelling and screaming, you're not going to get, it's not going to work. And people who are brave people are not listening to orders to evacuate. Now, are there some people that did not get an order to evacuate? I'm sure of that. But how many? I don't know. What I think people have to remember is that you guys were making this up as you went along, correct? There was no blueprint for something like no, that. No, absolutely. You know, these are uh, expert fire chiefs and experts in fire and collapse and things like that, but they're not generals in, in a war taking military airstrikes. You know, this is not something that, that we, any of us, do regularly, thank goodness. The McKinsey report also pointed out other problems from the lack of coordination with the police department to the way firefighters simply rushed into the buildings without checking in with commanders. 
Von Essen wonders what the McKinsey report would have concluded had the firefighters not rushed in. Picture that. Picture a chief standing in the street saying, I think this building is going to collapse in an hour and 40 minutes, so everybody stay here. And then the building standing up for six or eight hours, which is probably what they thought at the time. Of course, it was a couple of McKinsey people who once described Enron as the best managed company yeah. in the United States. That's, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Do you think in a certain way there's a, there's a hunt for a scapegoat in all of this? Always. You know, uh, it's too bad. But when you read that report, you think, like, wow, this, this is all they could find? They rescued 25,000 people, and they lost 343 brave heroes. For all of the criticism in the report, Mayor Bloomberg reminded one and all of the net effect of the firefighters' sacrifice. Putting aside any thought of their own safety, our bravest and finest carried out what the McKinsey Report describes as the most successful urban emergency evacuation in modern history. No one doubts how, how much you care about those guys, and yet, you know, today there's a lot of resentment among the firemen. Why? Why is it? The unions did a number on me, you know. Uh, but that's, you know, that's just the way it is. The firefighters' union felt betrayed by Von Essen, once a firefighter himself, who was elected union president. When he was appointed fire commissioner, he became part of management. After 9-11, resentment turned to hostility. For all their courage, firefighters are a tough, rambunctious fraternity. At a benefit concert shortly after the attacks, they booed him. Commissioner of the Fire Department of New York City, he is he here, Thomas Van Essen. They're an interesting bunch, firefighters. I mean, when they love you, they really love you. And when they don't like you, they really hate you. No, I know. I, you know, I, it bothers me, but it would never stop me. That happened to Chief O'Hagan, who was probably the finest fire commissioner we've ever had. He made them stop drinking, and they hated him. They hated Chief Bishop, who was trying to close some firehouses because the city was in desperate shape. So when the unions come after you, you make a decision that you're either going to do your job, do what, what you know is best for the firefighters, or you're going to roll over and, and make them happy. And I wouldn't do that if it, if it meant, you know, everybody in the world hating me. I wouldn't do that. Today, Von Essen has a new job, but is still working with his old boss, Rudy Giuliani. The former mayor runs a consulting firm that advises major companies and cities on crisis management. How prepared is the country? for something like this, again? Well, I think the firefighters and the police officers are, are fulfilling their responsibility. I don't think the politicians are. I think that um, they really let us down the past 10 years. I don't know how far back you want to go in not doing a better job of keeping these, uh, these low life out of our country. And we got people everywhere. We don't know who they are, what they're doing. As we said, Tom Von Essen is still haunted by the men who were lost that day. Men like Captain Timothy Stackpole, who'd been badly burned in a fire in 1998. When I looked at somebody like Stackpole, who had just spent three years recovering, rehabilitating, passing out from his therapy because he was working so hard to get back to work, and I think about him losing him, I say, this is, this is wrong, something's wrong. Do you question your own faith in the course of this whole year of, of horror and reflection? Yeah, I did a lot at the funerals, you know. You look across and you see somebody who just carrying a little baby, you know. Some of the ladies had babies a week, two weeks after the 11th. And, uh, you know, you think about what they're going to go through now. Some people losing a husband and a son, other people losing two sons. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. So I would question, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I hope there's a God I've always wanted to believe there was. I can't believe he's making conscious decisions that this stuff happens. You have some private conversations with God? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Use a few choice words on it? Yeah, sometimes I've been pretty angry and I've said a few things to him, but hopefully he's not recording. If Father Judge heard what you were saying to God, what would he have said to you? 
he would, you know, make one of those quick signs of the crosses, and uh, he'd understand. Father Michael Judge was the department chaplain. He was among the first men lost. The pictures of the guys bringing him out are just indelible. Yeah. Carrying first him out. one. Yeah. You know, there's been so many people have said that he, it just made sense that he'd be the first one, so he could go to heaven and get everything ready for everybody else, you know. The issue in New York is about the here and now and what to do with this emptiness. I think that this place should be a phenomenal memorial and it should be there for a thousand years for people to come and, and thank the, the people who, who sacrificed so much that day. But I don't think it's necessary to put two big towers up again. But New York's all about real estate. Yeah. Tom, right? Yeah. And there'll be room. There's room for some real estate on the other side. The people who lost their lives here ought to have a, a nice, you know, they ought to be able to see the sky, I think. It shouldn't be closed in. You know, I think it should be open. Well, at the World Trade Center were more than just symbols of American finance. The people who worked there were the very heart of it. Like the small investment banking firm of Sandler O'Neill. Its headquarters were on the 104th floor of the South Tower, but its roots were all over America, providing financial expertise and services to small and medium-sized banks and savings and loans in places like Wayne, New Jersey, Sioux City, Iowa, and Santa Barbara, California. Of Sandler O'Neill's 171 employees, 83 reported for work at the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th. Only 17 made it out alive. No one believed that the firm could recover, except perhaps for the people who worked there and let us follow and document their year-long fight for survival. We first began reporting on what was left of Sandler O'Neill just a few days after the attack. The firm had regrouped in a small midtown office, joined by crisis counselors and therapists. The surviving members were searching hospitals for lost colleagues and trying to console and help the families and friends of the dead or missing. Hey, Billy. Bill Hickey. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I just wanted to say hello and see if, uh, if I could do anything for you, buddy. The bankers and brokers and analysts had all worked the phones before, but never like this. Physically drained, emotionally numb, medicated with their own adrenaline. I've already touched base today with Wright, Clark, Edwards, Collins, Wisnowski, and Brett. Okay. Okay. The names and the families went on and on. Analysts, researchers, rainmakers, number crunchers, secretaries, and partners. I, I was with Patty Rosen this morning. Okay. Where are you? Yeah. How's she doing? She helped me more than I helped yeah. her. Sorry about all this bouncing around. Sandler O'Neill's biggest asset had always been its people. They made their living with their brains and their personal relationships. Now that intellectual and human capital had been depleted. It was just incredible that, that 66 people could be missing and nothing, nothing, just like they were gone. As that grim reality set in, the job of leading the crippled firm fell on the shoulders of its 45-year-old managing partner, Jimmy Dunn. Well, you see, not everyone's been found. There had been discussions about selling or liquidating the firm, but Dunn made it his mission to try and keep it alive. For the surviving employees, for more than 100 parents who lost sons and daughters, for the 46 widows and widowers, and their 71 children under the age of 18. How's this guy doing? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm sad but focused. The work helped deaden the pain, made them feel relevant. Within four days of the attack, they had already moved into temporary quarters, a customer service area given to them by Bank of America. But the firm's phone system, computer network, corporate records, and virtually every piece of paper had all been destroyed, along with the people who knew the most about them. We have no record of the deals in, you know, that we've done this year. Who the hell knows Charlie has be? It too. A list of their clients and phone numbers had to be reconstructed from memory. Entire departments had been wiped out. Almost all of the bond and stock traders killed, along with two of the firm's top executives. Herman Sandler and Chris Quackenbush. But Jimmy Dunn 
wasn't about to give up. This is an attack on the United States of America. This is an attack on our capitalistic system, which we've thrived and benefited from forever. You know, and I personally have. You know, they attacked my firm. They killed 66 of my people. They killed my best friends. If this was war, Sandler O'Neill had plenty of allies. Brokerage houses and investment banks, competitors in what had been the cutthroat world of Wall Street finance, offered equipment, people, and services. Whatever Sandler O'Neill needed to stay alive. So we're here and we're doing business. Sandler. Six days after the attack, the day the stock market was set to reopen, Sandler O'Neill had assembled a makeshift trading floor staffed by employees from other offices and departments, by friends, relatives, and volunteers, like Bobby Castrignano, a retired vice president at Goldman Sachs who walked in off the street. That day was extraordinary. I will never forget it, walking in the room, introducing myself to people I'd not known, uh, and them asking me, who are you and how can you help? And I said, well, I can take an order or I can uh, you know, relay an execution price to a customer. Or if things get really bad, I can get your lunch. Before the bell sounded, Terry Maltese, who had been running Sandler's investment fund, moved in and took charge for Frank Salvaterra, Bruce Simmons, and 20 others who had died on the trading floor. This has been a horrible week, as everybody knows. <clears throat> and it, it's amazing what's happened, and it's amazing everything we've had to do, and I'm very proud of everything we have done here. I'm more sad about everything we've lost and that we had to do this. Talking to the families was the worst thing. We've got a lot of distraught families, a lot of people that are very upset. People don't know what they're going to do, uh, and a lot of kids and, and wives missing their husbands. Um, a few days ago, we started collecting DNA here. Uh, <laughs> these are things I never thought any of us would do. Um, we've done them. We're going to continue to do every single thing we can do for the families for as long as it takes. But in order to do that, one of the things we need to do is we need to be in business. So today, we're in business. And it is going to work. We have no choice. Okay? We're going to do this, and we're going to do it because not doing it's not going to be an option. And people want to do business with us. At 9 o'clock last Tuesday morning, Frankie and Bruce were standing at their desk waiting for the market to open so they could trade. The market never opened, and they never got to make those trades. The market is going to open today, and we're going to make those trades. Yes, our friends are gone. The desk is gone. We're here, and make no mistake, Bruce and Frankie are here, and they're watching us, and we're not going to disappoint them. Thank you. But nothing went according to plan. Phones aren't working. What is with these phones? Mark, you're going to have to use that. Is that phone good? Yeah, we got to we rotate. You take that phone, and I'll, as soon as I'm off this line. That's my phone. We, we'd love to get an order somehow, some way. That crisis was solved in a couple of hours, but it wasn't the company's biggest problem. One of the cable news channels erroneously reported that Sandra O'Neill had suspended operations and was going out of business. So Jimmy Dunn, who had never done an interview before, went live on CNBC to let his clients and the financial community know that Sandler O'Neill was still around. You know, we don't, you know, write songs. We don't uh, write novels. We're Wall Street people. We're going to respond as we know how. And, we're and respond they did. A group of programmers and software specialists who had worked for an old college roommate of Jimmy Dunn's drove all night from Chicago to work on the computers. But no one from the outside world could help the employees of Sandler O'Neill with their grief. The funeral was... I know. Br brutal? It was brutal. I talked to his grandmother, and yeah. she was reliving all the stories and started crying. You know, no, what are you going to do? We're going to get through it. That's what we're going to do. Across the front of the office, on spreadsheets normally used to report sales and earnings, was a long list of funerals, wakes, and memorial services. And Jimmy Dunn was determined that there would be a Sandler O'Neill partner at every one. Oh, God. My best friend's on uh, Saturday. And a guy that we were in the same summer house with 20 years ago for six years is the same day, same time. 
and then uh, a great friend of mine's that morning, so I'll be both of those. And Herman's is on Monday, so yeah. I will miss him every day for the rest of my life. The services were heartrending, exhausting, and relentless in their sheer numbers. Sometimes two and three a day into the month of November. I want to go to the wake, so... Um, Every day seemed a whipsaw between somber responsibilities and small celebrations that Mark Sandler O'Neill's return to Wall Street. So, congratulations, boys, on the job you did on the Allied signature. First deal we announced after 9-11. And look at that date. <laughs> All right. Hey, Billy Boy! Hey, you see this big man? Where's that date? September 18th. Where's that company? Sandler O'Neill on <laughs> Excellent. That's a goddamn pretty thing, isn't it? Competitors threw commissions their way and included them in deals. And most important, their clients hung with them. As Sandler O'Neill tried to rebuild a firm that had been started from scratch 13 years before. We're going to need uh, long-term quarters. We, we have in the firm, we had a hundred and... 70 people, we're going we're gonna to be about 100, and we're going to grow, okay? For the first two months after the attack, Sandler O'Neill hemorrhaged money, expending a third of the firm's capital to help the families of employees who had died. They paid salaries and bonuses through the end of the year, making sure that total compensation was equal to or better than what they had earned in their best year. Family benefits have been extended until 2006, and an office has been set up to help families process claims and collect settlements from the federal government. And you got the email about FEMA? You should call that woman. I've heard that they will do as much as um, 18 months of mortgage payments. After a few horrible months, Sandler O'Neill's business actually began to improve. And while big Wall Street investment houses were having one of the worst years on record, Sandler O'Neill's clients, small and medium-sized banks, were prospering. And the bond market, 40% of the firm's business, has been strong. 8.7%, much higher than expected. The balance sheet has been in the black for the last 10 months. How long have you been in the new offices? Uh, we moved in in the end of January. We uh, moved in over Martin Luther King weekend. And on Tuesday morning, open for business. They're located in midtown Manhattan now, on a low floor of a building far from Wall Street and ground zero, with plenty of room to grow. Where's your equity desk? Uh, well, these, uh, basically, uh, these four rows over here. We have about 30 people now in total. So all these people are here, except for two. Yes, that, that's right. Hundreds and hundreds of people were interviewed for the vacancies. I will call him. I'll get references. If you're here tomorrow, I'll have him come back in. Many of them by Bobby Castrignano, the volunteer who unretired to help Sandler O'Neill rebuild. A handful of survivors decided to leave the firm, according to Terry Maltese, because they couldn't deal with the memories. When you lose everybody that you worked around, literally, if there were 12 people that sat near you and 11 of those 12 were gone, um, it, it's hard to sit in the desks and look around and see all new faces and not think about the old people. How has the firm changed? I can tell you for sure it's a different firm. There's 70 new people in the firm. And a firm like this is made up by the culture and the personalities of the people in it. Is there any more or less joking around? I don't think so, but the jokes are different. You know, is there any more or less work being done? No, but I think it's being done differently because it's different people. HSBC announced they're going to buy Grupo Financiero. The massive layoffs that rocked Wall Street even before September 11 have allowed Sandler O'Neill to hire top-notch talent. But Jimmy Dunn says it will be impossible to replace the 66 people who were lost. We never, ever tried to hire a person to replace a person. On a very small gesture, we retired everyone's phone numbers. Because it is going to be hard enough for, for people that we do hire just to be successful in this business, let alone if you tell them that we're hiring you specifically to replace Bruce Simmons, to replace uh, Chris Quackenbush, to, to, to replace anyone. When we talked in September, uh, you were saying, we're going to carry on, we're going to make this work. That's right. Uh, we're going to stay in business. Did you believe that 
at the time, deep down inside, did you believe that? Not really. You know, I, 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 in the, those dark days of September, uh, it, it seemed like it would be somewhat of an insurmountable task. You thought the firm might go broke. I thought that there, that there was a real, that, 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 that our existence was very, was, was probably doubtful. You didn't let anybody know that? No. No. I, I, I accept my wife. Are you surprised it's worked out the way it has? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A year later, the survivors and the victims' families are in the early stages of the moving on, getting on with your life process, mostly at the urging of grief counselors. The Sandler O'Neill Foundation has raised $7 million for long-term support for the families. And the firm helped them establish living memorials to husbands, wives, sons, and daughters. A baseball field in Shoreham, New York, celebrates the life of 24-year-old Kevin Williams, who was a bond trader. A high school football stadium in Minnesota, dedicated to Gordy Ameth, now has a beam from the World Trade Center. And the first thing any visitor to Sandler O'Neill sees is a sculpture dedicated to those who were lost. The names engraved in black granite. They wanted to give the kids, you know, they, they, just the idea to touch the name. They're still there in spirit and not just on the memorial. They're there in conversations and stories, in pictures on walls and on people's desks. Men, women, young and middle-aged. 66 people who worked together, played together, in some cases grew up together and died together one morning in September. There is no possibility that they will be forgotten. The very first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning is the 11th. The last thing I think about when I, you know, go to bed at night, when I finally get to sleep at night, is the 11th. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just a fact. So the chances of me forgetting are infinitesimal. In light of 9-11, has Saudi Arabia, our friend and oil supplier for half a century, now become our enemy? There seems to be little doubt that some Saudis have funded terrorism and exported Islamic extremism. Fifteen of the 9-11 hijackers were Saudis. So was Osama bin Laden. This summer, a RAND Corporation analyst told a Pentagon advisory board that Saudi Arabia is the kernel of evil, and they refused to help us oust Saddam Hussein from Iraq. President Bush has said to the world, you're either with us or against us. We went to Jeddah on the west coast of Saudi Arabia to find out if they're with us or against us. Americans think of Saudi Arabia as this, puritanical, repressed, hostile to Western culture. But this is also Saudi Arabia. Flirting teenagers in Western clothes hanging out at Jeddah's giant Starbucks. Dunkin' Donuts next to Victoria's Secret. Even Chuck E. Cheese. Since 9-11, Americans have a list of grievances against the Saudis. But another surprise. Almost everyone we met there has a list of grievances against us. What do you think of the United States? Now? You, personally. Yeah, now. She became our enemy. I hate America right now. Hate yes. He felt perfectly free to say that with a Saudi official listening in. The government here tolerates, maybe even feeds, the anti-American anger. And it's not just on the street. Hello. Nice to meet you. We heard it from Jeddah's rich and powerful. They're all upset about U.S. support for Israel, our go-it-alone foreign policy, and businessman Hussein Shabakshi says it particularly grates to hear Saudi Arabia labeled a terrorist nation. Do you think that you're now being scapegoated? We are conveniently targeted. We meet all that points on that particular checklist. We are Arabs, we are uh, Muslims, we are uh, sh male chauvinistic pigs, you name it. Mohammed al Kareji is a Jeddah businessman with millions invested in the U.S. You look at your newspaper and you look at uh, watch the TV, 
they're just putting, I mean, and uh, portraying the Saudis like uh, devils. <laughs> While the Saudi government is spending millions on a PR campaign in the States, trying to repair relations... We've been allies for more than 60 years. Saudi citizens are adding to the tensions. There's a grassroots boycott of American products. Some wealthy investors have pulled their money out of the U.S. And a lawsuit filed against the Saudis seeking more than a trillion dollars in damages has fueled the fire. The lawsuit was brought by the families of the victims who died in the World Trade Center. Well, what happened in the United States is a tragedy. But you cannot hold a country or government or other people responsible for the acts of individuals, terrorists. Which and why, the these businessmen ask, haven't all the U.S. oil companies and defense contractors that got rich in Saudi Arabia spoken up on their behalf? Did they help come to your defense, to no, your rescue? No. Should they? Absolutely. Have? There is no excuse for that. Not a construction company, nor an aviation company, nor a telecommunication company, nor fill in the blank. They have always received a special treatment, and they know that. They know it very well. That sense of betrayal runs deep. But what about Saudi Arabia's betrayal of us? What about its support for an intolerant, anti-American version of Islam? Prince Saud Al Faisal is the Saudi foreign minister. I don't think any of us knew that hundreds of your imams go into the mosques on Friday, at Friday prayers, and, and spew out hatred toward the West. We didn't understand that your school children are fed a diet of hate about is, the United States. This is absolutely a misconception. The moment the attacks happen, and the moment that we found, to our remorse, that so many of those involved in the attack were Saudis, the first thing that occurred to my mind is, how can this happen? How can this happen in spite of the friendship that we have for the United States. So the first thing I asked, I said, go through the uh, books that are taught in our schools mm. and, what and did see you find? what in them directs Saudi Arabians to be liable to be deluded by anybody who harbors enmity against the United States. I was expecting, <laughs> frankly, the worst. Even he thought students were being poisoned with anti-American vitriol. That's because he knew his government had long ago ceded control of Saudi schools and their curriculum to the hardline Islamists. Prince Saud says he was relieved when his textbook review showed that 85% of what was being taught was not hateful. But are you saying you didn't find any? 10%. Ah of what we found was questionable. Five percent was actually abhorrent to us. So we took a decision to change that, and we have changed. For years, Saudi schools have been so focused on Islamic studies that young people have emerged not only with a distorted view of the world, but unprepared for the modern workplace. Religion used to be the subject. Now it is a subject. That is a major change because we need good Muslims who happen to be doctors. We need good Muslims who happen to be economists. We don't need Muslims as a full-time job. That we don't need. And that was the education focus. That was time. the education focus. But the Islamists aren't giving up control of the young without a fight. A plan to introduce English in the fourth grade was recently shelved after imams raised a ruckus. Hundreds of foreign teachers already hired were told not to come. And then there are the mosques, the ones in Saudi Arabia and thousands they've bankrolled around the world, including in the U.S., to spread their vision of Islam. Are you denying that there is this anti-Western strain among your clerics, that it was exported, it, it, that it 
has, was brought to Afghanistan and brought to Pakistan. Are you denying that Absolutely. that is... Absolutely. The government has n not been part or parcel of any effort. Not the government, the clerics. To export. The clerics are part of the structure of society here. What he means is his country is a theocracy. Its constitution is the Koran, and its only law is what they call Sharia law. But does that law mean encouraging terrorism? God forbid. The Sharia law encourages understanding, especially with the people of what we call the people of the book, which is the Jews and the Christians, because we believe that our... The infidels. No. Mm. No, no, the no, 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 these are the, the people of the book. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Abraham. They may believe in Jesus and Abraham, but you're not allowed to bring a Bible into the country. Over and over in our interview, Prince Saud tried to paper over what divides us and emphasize what we share. When uh, Iraq occupied Kuwait, People in Saudi Arabia at that time were even called their, calling their sons Bush. Uh, Schwarzkopf is too difficult to pronounce in, uh, in Arabic, so nobody called his son uh, Schwarzkopf. Is it conceivable that somebody in 10 years' time would move from an, a friend to somebody who considers the United States an enemy? Is this conceivable? This is Apparently it is. But it's also true that during our entire visit, we encountered no personal hostility as Americans or as non-Muslims. Should I put on the abaya, I wondered, and put on a veil like every other woman here? But I decided not to. I put on the long black skirt and this black jacket, and I, not even wearing a scarf, and I kept saying to myself, the religious police are going to come out and get me. But you know what? Nothing's happened. Nobody cares. That was particularly true in Jeddah. It may be Osama bin Laden's hometown. His family is still prominent here. They run a big construction company. But Jeddah is cosmopolitan. Although the mall shops still close five times a day for prayer, it's relatively open to the outside world. But 500 miles south, Asir province is Al-Qaeda country. Most of the hijackers came from here. It's poorer, more isolated. The imams really run the show here. In the souk, this man would only agree to talk if he didn't have to look at me. He kept his eyes on the translator. Why won't he look at me? <laughs> he understands English. He understood my question. You can answer in English. Women in Islam are highly respected, he said, but our religion forbids looking at them. But he wants to ask a question now. Yes. Uh, he's asking you why the American people hate uh, or are despiseful des 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 of Muslims and Arabs. Uh, but tell him I, I don't. And, and I, Americans think that you hate us. Americans think that you target us, that you go to the mosque and you hear uh, the imam speak against us. And uh, that's what we think. We think you hate us. Muslims do not, uh, do not hate other people. Uh, they, uh, they might love their... Have to stop their there. Just stop. Tell him Osama bin Laden says kill all the Americans. Okay, Osama bin Laden... He understood that, too. But he said bin Laden's actions were nothing compared to the entire Muslim nations the U.S. had wiped out. Which nation did America when, yeah. wipe out? Kosovo, Afghanistan, uh, Palestine... No, no, Kosovo, the Americans went in to help the Muslims. <laughs> he finally said, well, I guess you're seeing different news than I am. More than likely, what he calls news is what he hears in the mosque. But many other Saudis are getting theirs from around the world. They're watching the BBC, CNN, CBS, 80% see satellite TV. And many of the information age Saudis were educated in the States. The U.S. used to issue student visas, no questions asked, to almost any young Saudi. 
But that's how some of the 9-11 hijackers got their visas. So now, if a Saudi wants to go to the U.S., he has to go down to the consulate himself and stand in line for hours, even wealthy businessmen. Up to 1,000 students who have enrolled in U.S. colleges this fall, due there now in September, have been told, forget it. They won't get their visas for months. One American diplomat said, we're losing the class of 2006. He said, while security concerns justify the extra scrutiny, the visa slowdown is still short-sighted because it's keeping kids out who would undoubtedly become pro-American. If Osama bin Laden's goal was to drive a wedge between Saudi Arabia and the United States, people here say he may have won. Let me ask you about a theory I've heard uh, from Saudis, that Osama bin Laden deliberately, deliberately chose Saudis to perpetrate 9-11. I have 9 no doubt of that. He in I'll order tell you for why. us to blame you. Not in order for, uh, for you to blame us, in order for both sides to consider each other an enemy and, uh, and separate. This is something that we will have to live with for a long time in order for that injury to heal in our hearts. That we allowed our children to be deluded by such an evil man and into doing such an evil uh, act. This is something that will remain in our hearts for long more, I think, than in the hearts of Americans. This special edition of 60 Minutes will continue. Right here on Air Force One. The I president's story. It's the one Dr. story of 9-11 you've never heard before. Until now, in his own words, on 60 Minutes 2, Wednesday at 8, 7 Central. Megan Donner, Miami Crime Lab. I specialize in DNA analysis. Like a fingerprint. We're all unique. So let me clue you in. Finally, something that's been on everyone's mind since 9-11. In case we're hit with a biological or chemical attack, are we prepared to deal with it? We put that question to George Bush's Secretary of Health and Human Services a year ago in an interview just weeks before the anthrax mailings. Well, that's the same question we're putting to Secretary Tommy Thompson tonight. Most experts agree that the anthrax attack last year, which left five people dead and 13 others infected, was just a minor bioterrorism event. But even so, it nearly overwhelmed our public health system. Which is why this past January, the president signed a bill giving Secretary Thompson more than a billion dollars to overhaul the nation's health system, which would have to respond to a bioterrorist attack. The greatest good that's going to come out of 9-11 is that we are going to be able to build a strong, viable, comprehensive state, local public health system. And what I'm really the proudest of is that, Mike, that it hadn't been done in the past. It had many problems, and we had dedicated people there, but they just had not received the resources. Because well, they hadn't re received the resources, because nobody believed we were fat, happy, and arrogant. That is correct. Why did it take a terrorist act, and then after that the anthrax? mailings to get things going after all we knew we knew that saddam was prepared with chemical and biological we knew that libya was trying to develop the we knew the soviets had a massive biological program underway we thought we were insulated we thought that america would not be attacked we were not prepared but that's a far cry from what he told us last september just days before the anthrax mailings we're going to show you what you said Okay. Take a look. We're prepared to take care of any contingency, any consequence that develops for any kind of bioterrorism attack. And you have three kids of your own. I have three kids, and uh, tonight, uh, tonight uh, I'm telling them that they are safe. And my granddaughter, who is uh, less than two years old, is safe as well. Three days after that interview, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia took the secretary to task for his comments on 60 Minutes. That's a pretty broad statement. It is. Do you stand that by that today? I do. And with evidence by what we did on September 11th, I'm absolutely assured that we could respond to any contingency and, uh, and control it. 
But will you still love me if, you t if I say to you, I don't believe that? I still love you. <laughs> what was your reaction to what Senator Byrd had to say to you? Well, I think Senator Byrd was very concerned, and uh, rightly so. I think uh, what I said probably was not said as appropriately as it should have been. What I meant to say was that we can respond to any, any contingency. We can respond, but can we respond effectively? That's the same thing many Americans have been asking this past year as they saw people in biohazard suits invading anthrax-infected buildings. What about detection, Mr. Secretary, in case of release in a subway, for instance? anthrax what's been done about that we are much better at detecting uh, chemical spills or chemical releases than we are mm -hmm. uh, anthrax and uh, the bacteria viruses uh, but uh, we haven't come up with a, a real good detection system yet but we're we're investing a lot of research dollars into it since september 11th the government has been working to develop sophisticated machines that can detect anthrax and other deadly germs, one already in place at the Pentagon, another being tested in the Washington, D.C. subway system. And what about hospitals? Last September, George Washington University Hospital, just a mile from the White House, was one of the few in the country that was prepared to handle a chemical, and to a lesser extent, a biological attack. These showers are designed to decontaminate individuals who have been exposed to a chemical or, in a rare instance, a biologic agent. Well, now Secretary Thompson is spending almost $200 million to make sure that every hospital in America can respond as effectively to an attack. And all those hospitals will be put in direct contact with this room. This is our command center, Mike. A state-of-the-art bioterrorism war room the Secretary had built across the hall from his office shortly after the attacks of 9-11. We got direct communication with CDC, with NIH. We also get communications from FBI and CIA in here. These various experts monitor suspicious outbreaks throughout the country 24 hours a day. Right now, they're keeping tabs on the current health crisis, West Nile virus. But this board would be lit up with cases of smallpox or anthrax or any other biological agent in case of an attack. Let me draw a scenario for you. Sure. Small cloud of anthrax right here, let's say, over Washington, D.C. What would be the response? You have to detect it first and find out. And then we will be able to pull in within hours, within 6 to 12 hours, 50 tons of medical supplies, antibiotics, things to treat the anthrax. The secretary has a dozen truckloads of supplies in secret locations across the country fitted with everything from gas masks to respirator machines. We have planes that are ready to go. We have up to 7,000 medical personnel that we can activate and direct into any particular community in America. What would you do in your own home as an individual to protect yourself and your family? Nothing. Leave it the way it is. I, I rely upon the first responders. And training those first responders, the local doctors and nurses, is the heart of Secretary Thompson's national bioterrorism response plan. But that is simply not enough, says Republican Senator Bill Frist, a medical doctor himself. Anybody that thinks that as a nation we're going to be fully prepared by what we in Washington do is mm -hmm. deceiving themselves. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if something happens right now, right where we're sitting, or where our viewers are, are listening, what would they do? Who would they call? Where would they go? Would they be able to recognize it? What medicines would they take? Very few of those could be answered. That's why Senator Frist took it upon himself to write a book for the average American on what to do in case of bioterrorism. First and foremost, he says each family should set up a so-called safe room where they can gather in case of an attack. You want to have this room as self-contained as you possibly can. And in it, you keep a fan or heater, spare clothes, bottled water, canned food, and a battery-powered radio or TV set, and a set of masks. These, these masks uh, are, are important. When you buy one, you want to look for this N95 certification. He suggests keeping sticky tape on hand and sealing up the doors and windows in your safe room if there is news of a chemical or biological release. It's as simple as that. 
But it is not that simple with what most experts agree is the most frightening of the biological weapons, something contagious like smallpox. Let's say a dozen people walk into emergency rooms across the country with flu-like symptoms and small pustules. Mm -hmm. Would doctors who didn't recognize it conceivably a year ago, would they recognize it now? As much parts. more likely. We are educating the emergency workers and, and the general practitioners and the doctors uh, through, a, through a series of, uh, of uh, emails, through a series of pamphlets, through uh, a series of articles that are put out weekly by uh, uh, CDC in Atlanta. Now, doctors should know that the way to treat smallpox is to be sure to administer a vaccine within two weeks of exposure. Until the September 11th attacks, the U.S. had less than 15 million doses of vaccine on hand, with plans to make more by the middle of the decade. But that has all changed. We will have in our inventory, by the end of this year, a, uh, a vaccine for smallpox for every man, woman, and child in America. And we're developing plans on how we would set up the system to get this vaccine and out to individuals if in case there was a smallpox epidemic. If I wanted to get a, a, a vaccination against smallpox right now, I couldn't, right? That is correct. But even if I said, hey, doc, <laughs> I want to pay for it, I want it. Why can't I go get one now? Well, first off, there's no question that the first responders and those people that are going to be in the emergency wards should be the first ones. And since you do not fit that category, you're not going to be the first one that's vaccinated. But then why not vaccinate everybody? Can't do any harm, or can it? Yes, it, there are some consequences. About two to four individuals out of every million people vaccinated by the smallpox vaccine mm -hmm. uh, could die. And approximately another 18 could suffer some, some, some consequences. Inflammation so, of the brain, so there are consequences. Right now, that fundamental question of should you, do you have the right to get have access to that vaccine that has not yet been answered by either the American people or our government. Well, the American people haven't been asked that question, really, have they? The only way we're going to be able to answer that question is to involve you. I think the federal government, the state government, and local government has a huge responsibility to give you the information so that you can best make that decision. Senator, you've said, I think it's about certain that we're going to see a biological attack in the U.S. that will kill with the intent to kill. You believe that? I do believe that. We know, we know, our intelligence community knows that uh, 12, over 12 countries have developed offensive biological weapon programs. And in this day and time, especially being at war, when we know that people have ill will against us, it only makes sense. It only makes sense that those weapons are likely to be used. I think there's going to be more. I think, I think uh, because of the kind of times that we live in, Mike, that we have to anticipate that. Tough job you've got. Some people think it's the toughest job in the federal government. 350 different programs and it covers the whole yeah. watershed of what human beings need and want in America. You a professional optimist because that's, you, you sounded and looked this way a year ago and you had your head handed to you just a little bit by Bob Bird and others. Yes, and the truth of the matter is we are better prepared than we have ever been in America. My people don't realize how far we've come, where we started from and where we are today. Am I satisfied? No. Will I ever be satisfied? I hope not. Conclusion? The public health and bioterrorism experts we spoke with seem to agree that for the first time, our government is finally taking the threat of biological terrorism seriously and putting the resources needed into protecting us. Are we there yet? No. But we're certainly a lot closer than we were last September. We're not going to build us the coolest treehouse. I don't have a clue what I'm... Before saying goodnight on this special edition of 60 Minutes, a few thoughts from Andy Rooney. We all look for something good about the worst things that happen. The good thing about what happened September 11th is it didn't just happen to New York and Washington. It happened to our country, all of us. Americans feel closer together than they did before that terrible day. 
people to whom New York had been a foreign country suddenly felt an affinity and an affection for it. Because the mainland of our America had never been attacked before, no one really knew how we would react to one. It was possible to imagine millions of Americans panicked and scrambling to flee the danger. In New York, if it was the target, maybe they'd clog the highway headed south and west. Well, they didn't do that. People in New York are going about their business. We have made heroes of those who died in the September 11th attack, and it was the right thing to do. Our attitude has turned the event into an emotional triumph instead of a bitter defeat. I was working as a young reporter in London in 1942 when the Germans were bombing the city every night. Much of London was destroyed, and it was terrible. The editor of a London newspaper talked about how the English reacted to that bombing. I wrote down his remarks, and they were so good I've kept them all these years. Listen to this. Many of us were anxious about the public reaction, he said. We didn't know how the people would stand up to it when the bombs fell. Neither the government nor the newspapers knew what the people who had been hit were thinking and how they would take it. That evening, putting out the newspaper, we decided to assume that they had acted heroically. The next morning, we printed all the stories that came into us of their bravery. Right then, the editor said, the newspapers fixed the pattern of how people ought to behave. Perhaps they would have behaved that way anyway, but there is good and bad in all of us, and the right example at the right moment can make all the difference in the way men act. Our American newspapers and television did the same thing with September 11th. They were filled with stories of heroism. Everyone knew what was expected of them, and they behaved as they were expected to. Reinforcing our resolve to be brave and good in adversity is reason enough for all the attention we are giving this September 11th anniversary. Wednesday, September 11th, on 60 Minutes to The President's Story. It's the one story of 9-11 you've never heard before. The President was Scott Pelley. What happened that day, minute by minute, as recalled by President Bush. I can remember sitting right here in this office, uh, thinking about the consequences of what had taken place, and realizing that it was a defining moment in the history of the United States. And I didn't, I didn't need any legal briefs. I didn't need any uh, uh, consultations. I, I, I knew we were at war. And the president spoke with us on Air Force One about his flight across America that day and about the White House threatened with imminent attack. He told us about his planning to go to war against terror and told us how he feels today, one year later. The farther we got away from September 11th, the more likely it is some around the world will forget the mission, but not me. Not me. I made the pledge to myself and to people that I'm not going to forget what happened on September the 11th. So long as I'm the president, we will pursue the killers and bring them to justice. We owe that to those who've lost their lives. We also talked to members of the War Cabinet who told us what it was like behind the scenes at the White House when Washington was under attack. And the president talked about the manhunt that's been going on ever since. Fair to say to the American people that there's a lot going on that we don't know about. And there's a heck of a lot going on they don't know about. I'm Morley Safer. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. Now here's what else is coming from CBS News. Hello, I'm Jane Clayson. This week on The Early Show, remembering September 11th, we'll look back to the victims, the heroes, and how America changed that day on The Early Show. This week on the CBS Evening News, as part of our special expanded coverage leading up to the 9-11 anniversary, we'll have exclusive new information on the continuing terror threat. Also, some untold stories of the bravery of victims' families and a special report on the real heroes of the Pentagon. All coming up this week. They wanted to tear America apart. Instead, they brought a nation together. Join us for 9-11, the day that changed America. Special all-day coverage Wednesday on CBS. Yep, this is going to be fun. An eight-hour flight with a screaming stiff neck. Over the next hour, survivors and...